So in this video, we're going to look at a rather special diesel engine from the Volkswagen Audi Group, the EA897. It came in various engine size capacities. It came as a 2.7 and a 3 litre engine. They both had 24 valves and they had turbochargers. There was also a bi turbo variant, which had two turbos, which made substantially more power. It's a six cylinder engine and the 2.7 is essentially the same as the 3 litre, just with a slightly reduced stroke. It was made from 2007 to 2000. 2016. So power substantially varied and there were certainly some differences within the models themselves. So the single turbo variant was driven by a GT2260 Honeywell turbo unit and that produced 245 horsepower which is very very respectable. You also get really good economy from this engine which really makes it a dream but it's often overlooked by people. The slightly smaller GT2556 was used in the 200 horsepower version and to get the bi-turbo working there were some other revisions made to the engine so most notably revised pistons which lowered the compression ratio to about 16 to 1 and they beefed up the oil and coolant pumps just to keep the engine supplied with enough cooling capacity and enough lubrication considering the extra power it was putting through. <laughs> So the 2.7 V6 typically had power that ranged from 161 horsepower up to 188 horsepower. The 3 litre V6 was certainly much more powerful. The lowest engine configuration there that I found, 201 horsepower, and that was pushed up to a mighty 286 horsepower when it was fitted to the Audi A6 and A7 after 2014. The bi-turbo was interesting because power on that started at about 300 horsepower and went all the way up to 300 345. So that shows the design of the block and the engine components themselves, they can certainly tolerate fairly high power figures. So there were some revisions obviously between the bi-turbo engines and the smaller capacity 2.7 litre engines. But in the main, the design of these blocks are great to work on. There's a lot of potential. So we're going to look at some of the best mods for these and see how you can make the most of your money when it comes to upgrading your 2.7 or 3 litre TDI engine. So because of the differences within the model ranges, a lot of people talk about swapping the heads over and other components in the engine taking, for example, the crank and pistons from the 3 litre and dropping that into the 2.7. So they're all good routes to go because all the maths has been done, all the calculations are in place, and you're, you're taking the Volkswagen Audi base engine and just really putting in the performance components that they've already worked on and fettled for you. So the mods we're going to look at is remapping, changing the ECU, upgrading the fuel system and the points at which you should consider an upgrade to your fuel system. We're going to look at intake and exhaust, popular areas for mods, but we're going to be seeing how effective those mods are on their own on the base engine and how effective they are when you tuned your engine. And we're going to discuss some other popular mods, head work and various other adjustments that can be made to the engine just to make it feel more sporty or respond better to the accelerator. So remapping is probably one of the easiest upgrades you can do to any engine and you certainly do get a big reward on the 3 litre and the 2.7 TDIs. So your basic economy map will typically raise the power by about 13 horsepower and you can go for a much more performance oriented map which gives you another 78 horsepower and 210 Nm of torque. So you will tend to find that a lot of these higher power gains you get from remats will require other mods to make them effective. So you need to look at the breathing of the engine, get the intake and exhaust sorted. So we'll discuss those in a moment. So there's various different options to changing the map the computer's working from. So the map itself contains the delivery of fuel to the engine, the timing of that fuel delivery. It controls the turbo, the wastegate on the turbo and where the boost is coming in. So the engine is doing a lot to manage the power and in turbo diesel engines there's usually a lot of scope for increasing the fuel and increasing the air supply even with the stock components that the manufacturers give you. So always go to a specialist that understands this engine. You'll often see turbos failing prematurely where people have got things wrong they've not taken into account the exhaust gas temperatures and other parameters within the engine and they're just working everything much harder than it was designed for. But when someone understands the engine, they can often get round problems that crop up, iron out those flat spots and advise you on other parts and modifications that you need to make to your engine. So one of the easiest options for changing the map is just a piggyback ECU, which 
interfaces between your ECU and the sensors and it will adjust the fueling. So be very careful. Some of these tuning boxes, they call them, are little more than devices that dump more fuel into the engine, but some are quite complex. They've got computer systems in them that actually make decisions and adjustments to the messages it gets in both directions and they can work out quite effective. But the best option is always to get your car set up on a rolling road because then with the rolling road and the computer diagnostic equipment that's attached to your car, they can get real time readings and see what's going on in your engine. So if you are getting flat spots or there's weak areas in the engine, they can work around that and they can certainly tune it to the max. So in terms of performance gain, the rolling road remap is usually the best option. The custom remap, there's also an off the shelf remap where they've taken the manufacturer's tuning and they've just bumped things up very slightly. So they're still working within a lot of tolerance. So there's still a bit of scope for improvement, but because little work and research and development, there's no labor involved. They're not diagnosing your vehicle. They're just providing a generic map on your car. That is a very, very cost effective upgrade and it can make a noticeable difference for the money. And the tuning boxes, they vary in complexity and price and what they actually offer in terms of return, but they're very easy to fit yourself. You can get them mail order. I've got one on my car from TDI Tuning and I'm very, very happy with it. It works really, really well and it gives me different settings so I can go for a performance option or an economy option. So certainly talk to these companies and just see what they're offering. Do you want to keep the economy? Do you want the maximum performance? Do you want a blend of economy and performance? Do you want the option of being able to switch between modes as you're driving? Because that is also an option in some cases with some setup. So when you've tuned your TDI engine, keep an eye on the clutch. Your clutch has probably got quite a few miles on it. It may well be starting to slip and it will have no doubt run to near the end of its life. So pushing more power through the transmission and through the clutch will just highlight that weak spot. So you may well need to replace that clutch. If you're replacing the clutch, it makes sense also to replace the flywheel. That's the big metal plate on the side of the engine that stores the kinetic energy and helps to smooth out the rotation of the engine. So it's a good idea if you've got a dual mass flywheel to stay with a dual mass flywheel. The single mass flywheels on those engines can introduce quite a few lumps and other problems with idling. So a lot of people have complained that they've gone with a much lighter single mass flywheel. So getting the engine to breathe, it needs to burn more fuel. And in order to burn more fuel, it needs more air. So making sure there's no restrictions in the intake is an important part of tuning the engine. So a lot of people think of induction kits and panel air filters and sports filters to improve the airflow. So on a standard engine, you will not notice a substantial increase in power. So typically on the dyno at the top end, you'll see about 5% more power, maybe 7% on some models, but the stock factory setup is able to deliver sufficient air for the stock engine. But when you've tuned it, you're starting to go outside of what the manufacturers are working to. So there may well be a restriction that's been introduced into that system. And if that's the case, you want to remove that restriction. Bear in mind that wherever you site this filter, it does need to be supplied with cold air from outside the engine bay. That warm air is carrying less oxygen and it's going to burn much less effectively. There's actually quite a few air filters around for the EA897 engine. You've got the Torx, the KNN33 series, the AFE and AEM. They all make decent intakes and decent setups for this engine. So just replacing the filter certainly goes some way, but replacing the entire intake itself will help to take it to the next level. And there's quite a few aftermarket kits around. I must mention the Dark Side Developments one. That's quite popular. Quite a few of our members have used that and really rave about it. So that's the single snorkel intake kit that they fitted on one of their Volkswagen models. So let's talk about turbo upgrades because the turbo is the thing that compresses the air and pushes it into the engine. And the work of the turbo is critical in a performance engine. So with a remap, you're pushing the turbo to the maximum limits that the manufacturers intended. So if you want to go beyond that you really need to get a better turbo so there's a number of hybrid options where they've taken the stock turbo and they've changed the internals so usually they make the compressor wheels slightly larger inside so there's quite a few turbos out there i would love to hear your experiences of them please let me know in the comments so we can eventually provide a video that's checking
looking at all of these turbos and discussing the merits and the pros and cons of each of them. The turbo systems offer a stage two and stage four, as they call it in their catalogue, and they're good for about 400, 420 horsepower, respectively. Falcon turbos offer what they call a stage two upgrade, and that's good for about 360 horsepower on these engines. Go tuned have the BV50, a billet turbo, and that's generally good for about 300 horsepower. And Race Hub offer a stage two, stage three turbo option in their catalog. And they're reportedly good for about 390 horsepower to 420, certainly that sort of region. Then you've got the Garrett turbos that people fit to these engines, the, the GTD 2263 VK, which spools up nicely and gives a decent spread of power. Generally good for about 350 horsepower. There's the Garrett GTD 2263 VZ, which is good for about 350 horsepower. It spools up quite nicely. If you want a faster spool up, you may be advised to go for the slightly smaller Garrett option, the GTD 2060 VZ. I'd say that's the best option for everyday driving and for people who want to do a lot of towing. But your choice of turbo does vary depending on the specific engine you've got. There's quite a few different options within the EA897 range. So talk to a specialist, talk to a tuner. You will find that the more custom your turbo, the harder it is to map. So it's usually best to get an off the shelf one in a kit form that's been designed for your specific engine. And there's an accompanying map or suggestion on how to map it that comes with it. So intercoolers. So let's have a look at intercoolers on the three litre TDI and the 2.7 TDIs on the EA390 engine, like the A4 and the A5. It's a radiator that the air comes from the turbo where it's warmed up because it's been compressed and it's exposed to ambient air temperatures, which takes that temperature back down again. And that allows the intake temperature to be substantially lower than it would be if you didn't have an intercooler. The problem is with intercoolers though is they start to get warm. We would call that heat soak. So if the intercooler itself is starting to warm up it's going to be less effective at bringing down those temperatures. So if your project is suffering from heat soak, you're hitting a restriction in the power after a spirited run, then look to increase the size of the intercooler. Now the big challenge is often fitting the intercooler to your vehicle. So removing part of the front bumper and mounting it at the front quite Quite low down is generally the route most people go but the actual setup will depend a lot on your car what the engine bay configuration is like and how much of a problem you've been getting from heat so don't look at the intercooler as something that's going to add power it's going to remove a restriction that you may have been hitting and there's a lot of aftermarket options around the various sizes and don't make the mistake of thinking that bigger is always better you need to think very much about the flow rate often these larger intercoolers although they are very very effective at cooling the air it will create a fair bit of drag on that intake air and the benefits you get will be outweighed by the drawbacks that's been introduced. So they certainly are worth considering. There's a couple of options to choose from. You've got the dark side front mounted intercooler and the AirTech Motorsport intercooler. The AirTech is suitable for slightly smaller cars. The fuel system, its ability to deliver fuel to the engine plays a big part on the success of your tuning project. And those factory injectors will start to top out. You'll find the ones used on the bi turbo are usually superior to those used on for example the 2.7 TDI so in some cases there's an opportunity to just buy an upgrade within the manufacturer but there's a lot of aftermarket units out there it's not just a question of upgrading the injectors you also need to upgrade the fuel pump itself to make sure that enough fuel is delivered so specifying the wrong fuel pump and wrong injectors can actually rob you of about 25 horsepower with the better performing variants able to deliver power of about 475 horsepower and the next stage taking that up to about 500 horsepower so obviously you need to do other mods to the engine to support that it's not just a fuel system mod but when you start reaching those levels you really do need to think about the capacity and exceed the flow rate required by the engine within the injection system. So exhaust upgrades on the EA897 is certainly worth thinking about. You've got all that air going into the engine, it's burning the fuel. You want to get that out of the engine as effectively as possible. So again, light intakes on the stock system, the TDI engines, the EA897, won't show significant gains just replacing the exhaust. The typical weak spots tend to be the catalyst and around the headers of the exhaust. Commonly, the restrictions that we see are often with those components. Now, manufacturers have tried to push their cars out at a set price point, so they don't over-invest in these things. They just want to make sure the car meets the emissions 
at the lowest price they can. So a lot of compromises are often made in manufacturer setup. You can get better flowing sports alternatives of both DPFs and catalysts. So generally they're larger, they are less restrictive of the airflow coming out of the exhaust. And if you're experiencing some kind of restriction in the exhaust, then that is probably the best area to focus on. So I need to just point out in a lot of areas, a lot of modifications to cars are illegal if they affect the emissions output of the car. So removing catalysts and DPF filters is illegal in most regions. There are a few regions that still permit that modification or they actually look at the vehicle's emissions rather than just banning any car that should have one that's had it removed. And in some areas, it's even illegal to remove a working catalyst or DPF filter and replace it with a better flowing sports alternative. So do check those legalities in your region and your area and just make sure you're not going to fall foul of any of your annual inspections or roadside checks that may be carried out. So there's also quite a few mufflers that you can choose from on the 3 litre and 2.7 TDIs. Black Widow, Blocks Racing, Magnaflow, MBRP and Baller, they all make systems. So availability will depend very much on your car. So bear in mind that these were fitted to large off-road vehicles smaller family saloons and there's a big variation in the types of vehicles that this engine was fitted to so that will certainly have a bearing on your choice of exhaust. So the EGR valve is the exhaust gas recirculation valve so is that something that's going to damage your performance? Well most EGR systems only operate at light throttle and when the engine is warming up so at wide open throttle under load when you want the maximum performance from your engine your EGR valve is naturally closed so the problem that a lot of people have with the EGR valve though is that they clog up, they fill up with soot. And with any engine that's burning fuel, particularly diesel fuel, you are going to get soot building up. It'll typically build up around the head of the engine. The EGR valve itself, it's not surprising it clogs up in there because it's quite a complex pipe system. There's a valve there that opens and closes and regulates the flow of exhaust gases into the intake. And modern systems are actually quite well designed. So should you actually delete it? Well, in most areas, regions and states, if you want your car to be legal, you shouldn't delete it because an EGR delete will generally render your car illegal. The emissions will not be within the standards that the authorities expect. So if they did an inspection on your car and found it deleted, you could find yourself with some sort of citation or fine or getting your car confiscated. But a lot of people are, are going out and investigating EGR delete kits. So these can vary in price wildly from just a basic blanking plate that blanks off the EGR valve and the intake as well. Some have a cooler system as well connected to them. So you would just need to work all of that in. So do your research carefully. Make sure you get a good quality EGR kit that's designed for your engine. If you do have an engine that you can just blank off successfully, then by all means go for it. But there's nearly always a requirement to make an adjustment in the ECU. So if the engine computer detects that the EGR valve is not working properly, i.e. it's been blanked off, it's going to flag up some kind of error. It may even back off on the performance. So EGR deletes are both a physical modification that has to be done to an engine, but they also require a software adjustment to be done. So there's more stuff coming up on the EA897 so please let me have your feedback and I'll take all of those comments into consideration when we start discussing each of the mods and upgrades that you can do to your EA897. So thanks for watching please boot that like button because that really helps us to get out there. Let us know what car you've got and that'll help us to address future content so we can address your needs and answer questions that you raise. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so because we would love you to stay tuned. I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.